Amen. What a blessing. It's a song that's wonderful to sing, and I think uh, the Lord's never called me on it, but I think it'd be sometimes harder to follow through with than to sing it. He puts you somewhere else to do what the Lord would have you to do. If you have your Bibles with that, I'd ask you to turn to the book of 1 John. 1 John chapter 5, and we're going to begin reading in the very first verse. 1 John chapter 5, in the very first verse. The Bible says, Whosoever, whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And everyone that loveth Him that begat loveth Him also that is begotten of Him. By this we know that we love the brethren of God when we love we love when when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. For whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. And this is the victory that overcometh the world even our faith. Who is he that overcometh the world? but he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. Amen. I'd like to preach the Lord be my helper this morning on the fall, living in true victory. Right. Dear Lord, we thank You for Your goodness. We thank You for Your watch care that brought us this way today. Lord, we thank You for this good place to meet out of the elements, Lord. We praise You for that. Lord to God, we pray this morning that You would bless Your preached Word we understand that nobody's here by accident, but rather by divine appointment. And we know uh, that you can work according to your mercy and grace. We pray these things in the sweet and the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Now, uh, fairly familiar verses of Scripture we'll be preaching from this morning. Uh, I believe the writer be John the Apostle. That's been debated over the years. And uh, I don't know exactly the writer, but I do know this. It was divinely inspired or it would not have uh, wound up here in this blessed book. And so it begins, Whosoever believeth that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. Now, a lot of people want to get that kind of out of order, but I want you to see the belief did not make the borning. Being born made the belief. And we live in a modern day today which tells you, well, if you believe that Jesus is Christ, then you're born again. Well, no, the new birth comes first, and then you believe. Amen. See, uh, repentance is the work of salvation and not the other way around. And we live in a day and age today, and that's the problem, and you have churches full of lost people, is that they think they can think themselves into redemption, and it doesn't work that way. Uh, and so we see that as Paul, I mean, as John is writing this, he reminds them, if you're born again, you're going to believe. If you're saved and redeemed, belief is the result of that work. Verse 2, by this we know, uh, by this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep His commandments. Now, uh, he begins to give them an evaluator of His salvation an evaluator of their salvation, if you will, do you love God's people? Now that that's a commodity today. And you know, I find among sovereign grace people, they can be some of the most stuck up people you can find. They can be the most self-righteous individuals that you can find. But I want you to see, as John is writing to the churches, he says, well, do you love them? Do you love people? You know, you know why he asked them that? What's the first uh, fruit of the Spirit? Love, right? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, goodness, faith, gentleness. So he wanted them to evaluate themselves. Are they really redeemed? Do you love those individuals? Are you interested in, in the welfare of other people? And so he says the best way that you can measure that is what do you feel about other people? And we live in the day and age that's very, very contentious even among God's people. And out there in the world, it's a thousand times worse. That's why people can go in uh, into a, uh, a hotel and blow 59 people away is because of the lack of love. You know, uh, uh, they want to blame the guns. Well, you know what? That fellow had to pull the trigger, did he not? A gun don't fire itself. And, and so we see we live in a day and age today uh, uh, where there is a, a great deal of lack of this love even among God's people. Verse 3, For this is 
the love of God that would keep His commandments. Now, uh, a lot of people don't like that verse because it brings the law back into play. But you know what? People that love God will honor those commandments. They truly will. Now, uh, I'm not saying they're going to keep them, in, you know, keep them down the line, but they'll honor them. They'll love them. They'll be interested. You know what? They're not going to speak against their neighbor. They're not going to speak against their brother and sister in Christ. They're not going to kill people. That, that, is, that, that is the nature of the new man is to follow the commandments. Do you love them? Are they grievous to you? When you have to honor thy father and thy mother, is that, a, is that an issue for you? Well, if it is, then maybe you should make your calling and election sure because the Bible says here to the redeemed that they're not going to be a grievous thing. Verse 4, For whosoever is born of God overcometh the world. Now in my Bible I have that written underlined because the reason is it's an, evi it's an evidence of redemption. Uh, you know, everybody, when, when we talk about the perseverance of the saints, everybody wants to jump right into the security of the believer, don't they? Well, this is the perseverance of the, the saints. You know what? Saved people are going to hold out. Yeah. That's not popular teaching today, but it's true. And you know what? If you run along and serve the Lord, and, but all of a sudden you can't find you in radar, with radar, you know, I don't have much confidence in you. Because the Bible says here that we'll overcome the world, that we will come out ultimately on top, that we will, with the strength of God, put the, put the challenges and the trials beneath us. Yeah. And so... If that's true, and I believe it is, it's the Word of God, then the flip side must also be true, must it not? Meaning that if we don't overcome the world, what, what is the, what's the indication? We've never been saved to start with. And, and, and they, both, they both have to be true if one is true. And so we see as John is writing, he reminds them that is what... What, that whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. Who, he, who is he that overcometh the world? But he that believeth that Jesus is the Son of God. Now, uh, I want you to also see this, that he, he brings it back around to the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, we live in a day and age today, and I see it more and more, where Jesus is being left out of the equation. His, uh, his name is offensive to some people. Yahweh. Yahweh is God the Father. That's not Jesus. Jesus is the Son of God. Amen. Jesus is Lord. See, there, 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 there's a de uh, defining point there. And you know what? We, we, we come here, we, yes, we're going to worship God, but we're also going to worship the Lord Jesus Christ. Yes, right? He, he, he is first and foremost. We're going to lift Him. You know what? He, he did a marvelous work on the uh, cross of Calvary and a victorious resurrection three days later. He ought to be praised and He ought to be worshipped. And we ought to give Him praise this morning. And, and so we see that as John is writing, he, he reminds them again, uh, uh, do you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you understand and know? Do you know Him uh, intimately and truly? Now, I want you to go with me. Uh, back with me, if you would, to the book of Genesis. Genesis chapter 32. Genesis chapter 32, and we're going to begin reading in verse 24. Now, if you know the section of the Bible that you're in, I believe it is a recording of the conversion or the salvation of Jacob who would become Israel. Uh, I do not believe that he was a saved man before now. Some people, he, he, he did have an experience with Christ, with God on the way out. If you remember, he had his, stone, his pillow stone. But here, he, it says that he struck. One or two things. He was saved here or he got back in the will of God. And I'm not sure which. But uh, he, he is an unusual individual that he even was able to touch the person of God. See, when, when we begin to think about salvation, you, you need to be sure you know God. 
Do you know the Lord Jesus Christ intimately? Because see, uh, anything less than that is it, it, a fake and a fraud. And so he either met him on the way in when he had that little dream and there was a ladder up to heaven, you remember that? And the angels descending and ascending. And here we find he's on his way back and he's almost there. And we'll begin reading in uh, we'll begin reading in verse 24. And Jacob was left alone. Now, if you want to evaluate your spiritual condition, you know the very best thing that you can do is to be alone. These, these big Jimmy uh, 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 Swagger used to be the big evangelist and Billy Graham and all that. You know the problem about eight or nine thousand people is you're not alone. You know the very best spiritual evaluation you can do is just you and the Lord Jesus Christ. That, 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 you know, uh, nothing wrong, you know, we're, we're, we're supposed to be together and not to forsake the assembly, but you know what? Every time I find out a spiritual issue with myself, I'm alone. Uh, when he comes to me and says, Larry, you've messed up, he don't do that in a big crowd of people. It's at, at that alone time uh, with the Lord Jesus Christ. And so he had sent all his wives and his children away, and now he was alone with God. And Jacob was left alone and there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day. Now that's another good evaluation. Is uh, have you ever wrestled to be in the will of God? See, being in the will of God is not as easy and picture perfect as a lot of Hollywood people will try to paint it out to be. It's a very difficult thing if you really want to be in the will of God and do what the Lord would have you to do. And, and, and the wrestling was here, and so I want you to see that as they were wrestling along, that it was hard on Jacob. It, it impacted him. Verse 25, And when he, meaning the, uh, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ, or the, God, the Godhead, I'm not sure, and when he saw uh, that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh, meaning Jacob's thigh, and the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. Uh, I want you to see also this that uh, you know uh, we don't. It's not. It's not something that's like today. But you know, when you have an experience with God, it's going to impact your flesh. That, that's why being separate from this wicked world shouldn't be an issue for most people because it impacts the flesh. Now, I'm not, you know what? Uh, I, I've seen people with a disjointed hip. That, that's a very, very painful injury. Uh, in the modern day, you know what we do? Uh, we do surgery on it. We open them up from back here and pop it back into place. They didn't have that in David's day. You know, most people... And some of you that are older than me remember, people used to die from broken hips because there was nothing they could do about them. And they'd lay around until they died. See, Jacob, uh, Jacob could have been like that. See, being close unto God impacted him uh, in, in a very unusual way. And if we are as unto the people of the Lord as we should be, being with the Lord, being near unto the Lord should impact us uh, in some way, leave a result in our life. Verse 26. And he, meaning the God person, said, Let me go for the day breaketh. And he, meaning Jacob, said, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. And he said unto him, What is thy name? And he said, Jacob. Now, I want you to see, even in admitting what his name was, he's saying, I'm a thief. That's what Jacob means. You know, you see a lot of people named Jacob today. You go, man, that's a good Bible name. Well, in Hebrew, the problem with that is it means you're a thief. It means that you uh, steal things. It means you take things that don't belong to you. And, and man, he lived up to his name, did he not? You know, uh, used to people would wait a while, you know, the day, the modern day, we had all our kids except for Matthew name before they was ever even thought about. And, uh, we uh, but back then they were used to. I, I've gone through census records, uh, doing genealogy. They used to have baby down there, and that child might be eight or nine months old. And the reason why they they would look at the character of the child, and and they would take some time and name, uh, give that name a kid a fitting name, and 
they did that with Jacob. And the reason that he got his fitting name is because he was a thief. That was his nature. He was against God. And he was against God in every way. And so we see that as he's wrestling with this person of the Godhead, he says, my name's Jacob. And he changes him. He impacts him. And he said to him, what is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, thy name shall no more be called Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince thou hast power with God and with men, and has prevailed. Now, you see what a wonderful statement that is. He changed his name to Prince or Victor or being victorious. And he says, this is, this is what it means. You have power with God, and you have power with men, and you are a prevailer. You know, what a wonderful thing to think about if you are a prevailer on the merit of God. Yeah. See, we live in a day and age today of a lot of defeated Christian people. And the reason why we've about ascertained to the point that we're going to measure our victory by why the world measures their victory. By money, by position, uh, by numbers, however you want to do that. But I want you to see that in this little battle that he was having, he says, you are a victor. And so I ask you that this morning, are you a victor? Are you a prince? Are you an individual that is above the board and that you're winning the battle that, you, that you're in on a routine basis? Or do you live in defeat? Because it is very critically important. And we'll see how it comes out in your life. Verse 29, And Jacob asked him and said, Tell me, I pray thee, thy name. And he says, Wherefore is it that thou doest ask after uh, my name? And he blessed him there. And Jacob called the place... Uh, pen, pen nail, or Peniel, for I have seen the face of God. And that literally means in the Hebrew, face of God. So he had done business with God. Now, whatever, again, as, as John was writing, the Apostle John was writing to the churches, he was asking, Do you have an experience? See, Jacob left this place, Israel after an experience with God. He strove with God. He held on to God. And He came out a different man. See, if, if whatever you're trusting for redemption didn't change you, there may be a big problem there. See, that, 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 that's the thing today is that we, you, know, you don't get a room for fruits of salvation when you're the one in control. Now go read the book of Acts. That is one example of redemption in the Old Testament, and there are many, but I wanted you to, to look at that one particularly. But go with me to Acts chapter 9. Uh, everybody knows of the conversion of Saul of Tarsus. Now, I want you to see some similarities. Number one, Saul was not a person that loved Christ, but that he was a person that loved religion. And we live in a day and age today where there are a great deal of many people that love religion. They like to do things. They like to go in and, and be seen. They like to do things in a ritualistic manner. Every one of us, I hope this morning, brushed your teeth before you got up to come down to the house of God. You know what? That, that, that many cultures view what we do with our teeth as a ritual. And you know, it does meet the criteria. We do it routinely. We do it without fail, and we do it with an expected outcome. Right? And so it, 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 is, it is a type of a ritual. And, and, and uh, Paul or Saul was just that kind of guy. He was a Jew among Jews, but he'd never been truly converted. Acts 9, in the very first verse, the Bible says, And Saul, yet breathing out threatenings, and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord went unto the high priest and desired of him letters to Damascus to the synagogues that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, uh, let me ask you this. Does that sound like somebody that's seeking God? Does that have sound like somebody that has any kind of interest in eternity? See, uh, what he wanted to do was shut the Christians down. 
He saw them as a problem as a Jew. And he saw them as a problem as a Roman employee. He, he saw them, he saw them as, as kicking up dust in Jerusalem and, and, and creating a situation that would not be favorable in any way. And that was how he was... He, he had no interest in the eternal things. Verse 3. And as he journeyed, going down to Damascus, as he journeyed, he came near Damascus and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven. Now, I want you to see, uh, first of all, whatever salvation experience you have or you don't have, uh, uh, light better be involved. And I'm not, sorry, I'm not trying to say I saw big lights the day the Lord saved me, but I did see myself in the light of, uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ, and I saw myself exceedingly sinful for the very first time. See, that's, that, that, that is necessary for redemption. Yeah. Another thing that's necessary for redemption is to hear the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, some uh, well-meaning people <laughs> think people are saved and don't even know it. Uh, I, I don't believe that. Because see, once you're saved, you know it. Once the Lord does a work in your life, you're, you're different from, for, for, from then on forevermore. And you know what? People don't have to remind you of that. People don't have to tell you when you were saved because you know it. And, and, and so as Paul is going along and, and he, he sees this exceedingly bright light, it reveals things that he hasn't seen before. Uh, verse 4, and he, and he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Now, I want you to see that uh, uh, that Paul uh, is convicted by what the Lord said. And, you know, and, and uh, <laughs> he had never even seen Christ in the flesh. So, how was he a persecutor? He had never uh, walked hand in hand with the Lord. He'd never heard the Lord audibly before this point, didn't even know who he was. So, the persecution came. Just this way, he was persecuting the Lord's people and thereby persecuting the Lord. And, and, and even further than that, he was denying who the Lord was. See, if you don't believe the Lord Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that is persecution. That is coming out against the Lord. And uh, when did he hear the Gospel? He heard the Gospel to stoning of Stephen, did he not? That, 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 that's when he, very first time he heard of the Lord. Verse 5, And he said, meaning the Lord, Who art thou? Uh, and he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Now, I want you to see, I want you to see there uh, the importance of, uh, of the missing element in the modern day, and that is the pricks or the golding of the Lord God of heaven. See, when, when you can agree to a sinner's prayer, there's no golding, there's no pricking, there's, there, there, there's no conviction of the Holy Spirit. But listen, it doesn't matter how many times you've invited Jesus into your heart, if you've never been golded and never been pricked, you know what? Redemption is still not yours. See, the pricking is, is, is all important. Because, see, that identifies you as a sinner and Him as the answer. Um, we live in a day and age where the, the work of the Holy Ghost is very limited. Well, let me say this. The Holy Ghost is the, is the person responsible for that pricking of the heart. And He does it. And He does a good job with it. And he, 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 that, is the, that is the way that conviction... Comes. And so we see as Paul is walking along the road to Damascus that the Lord manifested Himself in a very uh, special way. Verse 6, And he, meaning Saul, trembling and astonished, said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, Arise and go into the city, and it shall be told thee what thou must do. 
Now, I want you to notice a couple of different things. First of all, his attitude is completely changed, and he now has an attitude of humbleness, and he was willing to do whatever was necessary to follow the Lord. Uh, he was willing to do, uh, to be obedient no matter what, to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. See, that, that, that is a fruit of salvation. People that uh, do not want to follow the Lord, uh, you have to be wary of them. You have to be wary of them. People that don't have any interest in following what the Lord has given them to do in His Word, uh, uh, we, need to, we need to watch that uh, among the Lord's people. And so we find here that as the Lord's people, huh, if you want to live in victory, you have to have a real salvation. We find that Jacob had a real salvation and Paul had a real salvation. And because they did, they lived in victory. You know, today, why I believe we see such a defeated Christian people, I don't believe a lot of them has ever tasted redemption. Because if they, if they have, they have the elements to be victorious, do they not? We do, do we not? We, 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 have, we, have the, we have the pieces and the elements to live a very victorious Christian life if we would. And so redemption this morning is the key thing. Do you really know the Lord Jesus Christ? Do you truly know that He is your Savior? If so, you can be victorious. Go with me to Acts chapter 23. Acts 23. Uh, verse 9. Acts 23 and verse 9. And there arose a great cry, and the scribes that were, uh, were of the Pharisees' part arose and strove, saying, We find no evil in this man, but if a spirit or an angel have spoken to him, let us not fight against God. Now, uh, it's kind of bring you up to the day, you know, of the, after the redemption, the salvation of Paul. He was called into the ministry. He was a very faithful preacher to the things of God. And when you're a faithful preacher to the things of God, you wind up in trouble a whole lot. And this is exactly what happened to Paul. He was arrested. He was in jail. And uh, he, uh, all he was simply doing was speaking of the things of Christ, and the Jews did not like that. So we find him uh, once again arrested and put into jail. Now verse 10 says, And when there arose a great dissension, the chief captain, fearing lest Paul should be pulled between, had been pulled in pieces of them, commanded the soldiers to go down and to take him by force from among them and to bring him into the castle. Now, did you get that? It was such a it was such a violent time, and it was uh, really the Pharisees and the Sadducees. It was two groups that did one believed in the resurrection and one did not. Really, was the issue was pulling on him so much that it was about to, to literally pull him in two. Now, does that sound like something that you want to experience? See, uh, what, what gave Paul the strength on that occasion? It was the Lord. See, what, 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 why, why would he put himself in harm's way? It was because of his redemption, because of real salvation. He did not have the fear that we, that we have. Verse 11, And the night following, the Lord stood by him. Now, did you, did, did you get that? Uh, the night following. See, uh, we like things to be just that quick, don't we? But Paul spent a lonely night. See, that was really night two, if you count that like it should be, because of the night following. But he was arrested, and it was that night, and then the night following. So he spent all night in jail, all the next day, and my guess was that he was praying, that he was seeking the Lord, that he was looking for the Lord. Uh, and, and, and nothing happened. He wasn't set free. Nobody came to his assistance. Nobody came to help him out. Nobody came to say, Paul, I'm praying for you. Titus didn't show up. Timothy didn't show up. Nobody came to see him. But the night following, see, that's the person. You know what? Paul didn't give up. Paul didn't quit. That's perseverance of the saints. 
The night following, the Lord. You know what? I love the encouragement of dear friends, but I love the encouragement of the Lord far, far more. Amen. It's a better, sweeter thing. And, and, and so we see, we, we, we see that Paul received it, but it took some waiting. See, God's people, really saved people, will go on and on and on. And the Bible always proves that to be true. Verse 12, uh, I mean, uh, I'll read the verse of verse 11. That night following, the Lord stood by him and said, Be of good cheer, Paul, for as thou hast testified of me in Jerusalem, so must thou bear witness also at Rome. And every time that you find Paul testified, I believe it's either three or four recorded times just in the Acts of the Apostles, that he gives his testimony. You know what? Uh, that's why he, he told Timothy, he says, you be ready to give an account of the faith that's within you. Women, you need to be ready to give an account too. On the grocery line, to your children, to somebody on a dying bed. Men, how long has it been since you uh, stood up in the services and said, let me tell you what the Lord's done for me. He saved my soul. He, he did something that I couldn't do in and of myself. He gave me life. He breathed life into me new and made me something that I wasn't. We'll be able to praise Him for that. Amen. See, the reason that Paul wasn't a quitter is because he had something that went beyond the church. He, went so, he had something that went beyond his group of friends. He had an innate relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and that's all that he needed. And it was sufficient. That's the kind of life that we need. Verse 12, And when it was day, certain of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under a curse, saying that they would neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. And they were more than 40 which had made this conspiracy. Now, I just read that to show you this. People are not going to be an excited, excited with you for a strong stand with the Lord. Now, if you're an okay, mediocre stand, man, they like you. But don't you take it too far. Don't, 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 don't you get crazy with it. See, we need to understand that. See, Paul, can you imagine hating somebody say, I ain't going to eat or drink until we take care of the problem. Mm. Now, the, the funny thing to me is this. <laughs> Someone must have starved to death if they was faithful to their commitment because... You know what? He didn't die then. It was a long, long time before he died. Uh, you know what that makes me? That makes me... Bob has a lot to say about oaths and swearing. Did you know that? And you bet, it, it's no light thing to, to make an oath at all. And so we see that uh, they, couldn't, they couldn't stand Paul for who he was. 2 Timothy chapter 4. 2 Timothy chapter 4, where Junior was all over, he's over each other's lesson today. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 17. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. Now, uh, this is a separate time, a separate set of events. And again, we find Paul by himself, and we find that the Lord is with him. He says, notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me. Now, I ask you this, have you ever experienced that? Because see, to me, that's a cardinal sign of a true believer is when you receive strength from the Lord. And if you've never experienced that, and you don't know what I mean, you know what? Maybe it's time you need to make a calling and election sure. Because listen, if you've been to the down and outs, and I have, I've been there a number of times, and when nobody else can say, Larry, it's going to be okay, or if they say, you know what? I have a wonderful wife. I'll raise one, one fine daughter, and I really mean that. But there's sometimes even Donna can't encourage me. And when she does, and, 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 but y'all don't know what I'm talking about, not to be critical, it's just like a sounding brass and tinkling cymbal. Not that she's not sincere. It just, it just not enough. But in the stillness of the night, the Lord comes by and says, it's going to be okay. This is going to be all right. 
See, that's what Paul was experiencing. And if you can't relate to that, there may be a spiritual problem somewhere among, among the place because we ought to be able to understand what he was saying. Notwithstanding, the Lord stood with me and strengthened me that by the preaching might be fully known that all the Gentiles might hear and I was delivered out of the mouth of the lion. So, did you, did you get that? You, you know where he was on this occasion? He was in the lion's den. See, you don't have no other strength when you're in the lion's den, do you? You say, well, good thing that won't ever happen here. Well, you better, you better think long and hard about that. You know, you know what? These last days of violence, and I'm still very unconvinced of what happened out in Las Vegas, but... We have a very bloodthirsty people. We really do. And bloodthirsty people do stuff like throw throw folks to the mines, right? And and, and so we see, uh, we it it is not outside the realm of possibility when you don't fall into what they think is right to experience stuff like this. Verse eighteen, and the Lord shall deliver me from every evil work and will preserve me unto His heavenly kingdom to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Now, if you ever memorize the verse, you take 18 and you commit it to memory and will preserve me unto His heavenly kingdom and will preserve me unto His heavenly kingdom. You know what? When I leave this place, when God wants me to, you know when I'll be done with my course in here, when the course is done, set, when, when I finish the course He set out for me, then my time will be done. Now, a minute before, you know what? You know what the treasure that is? They can't take my life. Yeah. They truly can't. Right. Now, if God ordained it that way, and that's my way to go, yeah. But you know what? If He didn't ordain me to go that way, they couldn't kill me if they tried. I, that, that, that's a great deal of security for me. Yeah. Uh, well, well, what a thrill, what a wonderful thing to know that you ain't leaving here if God says so. We'll be able to give you praise for that. Last place, Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12 in the very first verse, the Bible says, Now about that time Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. Now I want you to notice a couple of things. First of all, that the vexation of the church has always been, and he's always used individuals to do it. Um, you know, that's one thing you need to understand and know about the Lord God and about Satan. Satan is just a mimicker. He's just a, a, a copycat. And so he's going to use things around us, like the government, yeah. and individuals out there to vex the church. Because you know, a vexation, you know what the goal of vexation is? It's to stop. To vex, to to hold, because you know what? He don't want us going forward. He don't want us to move closer unto the Lord. And so uh, uh, the devil used the the ruling monarch at that time, or, or the person in the charge of that province, to do this. Now, about that time, Herod uh, the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of church. Uh, uh, of the church, and he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. Yeah. Now, uh, why is that significant? Who's the inner three? Peter, James, and John. Right? See, with, with one person, he got a third of the inner circle, right? Uh, you know what? You sure didn't see him go after Thaddeus, did you? Or, uh, uh, or that other Judas, uh, there was another Judas that was involved, didn't go after him. He went after the inner circle. So you know what? If, uh, if you're getting beat up on this morning, 
could be because you're in the inner circle. If he if if he's really sat down in on you and, and worked you over good recently, this could be the cause. Verse three. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. Now, uh, I'll tell you what, that, that, that's not just thrown in there for nothing. Uh, that he was going to take the, the, the next third of the inner circle. And, but the reason that is significant for the days of unleavened bread is this. is because uh, the Jews didn't want it to done on that day. Uh, so they said, okay, we'll get an arrest him, but wait till Passover. This was probably the Passover after the Lord's ascension a year later. And uh, he said, uh, he, there, you know, you wait till that's over with because that's our holy day. <laughs> they, they were still self righteous, weren't they? They still wanted to be, oh, we're so, you know, we're so tied into Jehovah God, uh, we don't want it to happen on that day. And that was, that was their advice to them. Verse 4, And when he had apprehended him, meaning Herod had apprehended uh, uh, Peter, he put him in the prison and delivered him to four quanturians of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Peter therefore was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church of God, the church unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth the same night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and the keepers uh, before and, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. Now, did you get that? He's chained up. Soldier on each side. So the sun is up. He's going to die. But I think this is remarkable. Peter was asleep. Mm-hmm. You know, that's, a, that's some peace that we probably don't understand about, isn't it? He was comfortable. He was okay with it. Uh, you know what? A lot of us have done give it up. Yeah. Just think about me. Your pastor Peter was their pastor. Down here at the jail. I'm going to be executed at dawn. What would you do? I mean... The, the week of Easter, or the week of Passover really is what it was. Seven days of praying nonstop. Nothing happened. God didn't move. God didn't do change anything. The, there was no, no indication whatever that things were going to be any different. What would you do? The very last night, what, what are you going to do? See, those people were still praying. <laughs> And the Lord delivered him. Sent an angel in there, got him out, didn't even wake the soldiers up. Left the whole place behind. In fact, Peter says to Peter, he said he thought he'd send a vision. He didn't know it was even real for a little bit. Right. And then he went down to the, ch- the house where they was meeting and beat on the door, and Rhoda thought he was a ghost. Tried to get in there and, and finally they let him in. And, and they just couldn't believe what their God had done. And that's where we're at. So today I ask you, do you have huh, do you have an understanding like this? This is what the love of God is about. This is the victory. This is living beyond the routine and the everyday. This is living in the victory of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is uh, believing that He does exactly what He says. And you know what most people would tell you today of those events? That was an apostolic event and it couldn't happen today. And my question to you is why? I don't think you'll find the Bible teaching you that, do you? And so, this morning I ask you, do you really know Him? Uh, How's your happiness? How's your joy? How's your gladness? Do you, do you know Him intimately? You know, when we arrive one day at the throne room, I don't think anybody's going to have to say, that's Jesus over there. I believe I'm going to know Him. I know Him intimately. Uh, what about you? See, if you don't, you, you, you stand in, in grave danger. 
If you don't know Him in that closeness, you can. Has He ever spoke life to you? I'm not talking about the same sinner's prayer as He spoke to you. Don't worry about what you said to Him as He spoke to you. Because that's really what it's all about, is it not? That's right. 